Hey, hi. My name is Saad Kadi. I'm the head of uh, CERT EU. So CERT EU is the CERT for all the EU institutional bodies and agencies. Um, and today I would like to talk to you quickly about supply chain resilience. Um, so there might be something hidden in the slide for those participating in the challenge. Uh, I've been the, uh, told by David to, talk, to tell you so. Um, so to help be clear, um, so as you certainly know, supply chain attacks are obviously on the rise, uh, but we tend to think of them as kind of like uh, only from the um, technical side, like software, hardware that we're using, etc. But of course, we also have to consider suppliers, providers, and contractors in the larger sense, and we have a lot of blind spots uh, abounding there. So, uh, from a CTI perspective, monitoring the supply chain as, um, I would say, uh, precisely as possible is a must because we not only have to take into account the cyber cyber security, sorry, cyber security track records of all the suppliers, providers, contractors, um, uh, that we are working with, uh, the leaks that they experience, any geopolitical developments that might influence uh, them in any way or fashion, plus also all the merge and acquisition uh, operations. So the problem that we are facing here, what we're trying to uh, work on, is how to build a list of suppliers, providers, contractors, and maintain this over time. It's like asset manage management, but from a different uh, angle. So uh, let's start with the software and hardware. This is, I would say, rather easy. Uh, it's, again, asset inventory, uh, but with a twist, because, well, you could use external attack surface management. Uh, this would be, I would say, uh, rather easy to do for your internet-facing assets to understand what software and hardware you're running in our organization, plus potentially shadow IT that you don't know about. But it's, it's a harder problem for non-publicly exposed assets. Uh, so because we tend to think of uh, only our external attack surface management, but not the internal one, uh, to which I would say suppliers, contractors, and uh, providers might have access through to a VPN, I would say, uh, connection, uh, data exchanges, and what have you. Second part is the login and detection, uh, obviously. So could we detect, for example, when our software or even hardware uh, is pinging home, uh, trying to uh, download updates, uh, send checkup, or what have you to the uh, vendors, and also all the outbound connection from an organization to um, SaaS and uh, different cloud infrastructure. Last but not least, and this is us technical people that we don't really think about, uh, discuss with the procurement department because normally in a normal organization, procurement um, is there in the critical path before you can purchase anything. So if we could work with procurement and uh, also see with the framework contract that you have in our organization, maybe we could get notifications if there is a new supplier, provider, software, hardware, both in an organization. So basically follow the money. Um, now, on the services side, this is harder, um, definitely harder, uh, because uh, you would have to maybe see or try to find a way to monitor the communication between the, uh, you and the providers and contractors, including, for example, the VPN, uh, how they remotely access to your network if they are doing IT maintenance or uh, what have you, even, I would say, um, different type of maintenance and development for you. Also, connection to cloud tenants. Uh, so from your organization to these providers, of course, well, the obvious one, GCP, Microsoft, Azure, uh, et cetera, but there are other type of cloud uh, hosted infrastructure. Uh, also monitor kind of like the directories and processes and workflows uh, that you have um, in-house. For example, let's say you're working with an IT provider, this IT provider is doing kind of like development for you. They are connected to your infrastructure, through, I would say through a VPN uh, to your infrastructure. So uh, there you would have to provision user accounts for them. You have to create OT user groups. So maybe um, uh, in your workflows, uh, in your uh, Active Directory, you would have groups created and you might be able to receive notification through change management uh, if you're implementing that. Uh, and maybe going through the description of various groups, you might understand that you're working with supplier X or Y. And again, procurement and framework contract, because again, uh, procurement should be in critical path before you could purchase any kind of service in a normal uh, organization. But there are a lot of other OT things to consider. 
uh, you know, I'll uh, give you just kind of like not an exhaustive list, but I would say because the problem is hugely complex. So cascading supply chain, for example, think log 4 j or any dependencies that you might have on software. Subcontractors in outsourcing, you struck a contract with, I would say, supplier X, but supplier X has a contract with sub-supplier why, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And also consortium. For example, if you uh, put, put a public tender in, you have a consortium answering. So you would have to inboard all the suppliers or all the members of that consortium in your CTI. Um, also tracking M&A. This is, I would say, very interesting because when business DDs happens, etc., there are also geopolitical developments that you might be concerned about. Let's say, for example, a hedge fund buys provider X. So, which usually would mean that uh, the product, uh, kind of like a development, etc., would go down the drain, while the marketing and getting into Gartner uh, goes up. So, if you see a solution that is in Gartner, uh, top uh, right corner, and kind of like development is uh, receding, so probably hedge fund is behind that. Um, not giving any example here, but there are many examples of that. Or, for example, a corporation, I don't know, like EU-based organization or, or what have you, that have been bought by an unfriendly nation state. Uh, uh, so this might change uh, the way you look, I think. And last but not least, the impact of local laws. Uh, so as you may know, so in China in 2021, there was a law that was has passed demanding that any tech business would pass on vulnerability information to them uh, be uh, before anyone else. So this may be why they are so good at exploiting vulnerabilities uh, and finding zero days. Uh, and I invite you to read a, a really nice kind of like report by the Atlantic um, uh, Council uh, that was, I think, published at the end of August or um, beginning of September regarding this. And I'm done. Thank you.